What's going on guys? Welcome back to the Honeystead. My name is Kaylee and I'm gonna take you guys and we are gonna do a garden tour. It's been a few weeks since I've kind of given you guys an update on some of the things that we have growing here in our, our beekeeper's garden, my apothecary garden, the flowers, all the pretty things that we have growing. Um, we grow a lot of medicinal plants here, uh, mainly to stock our apothecary for, for us to be able to use. Um, and we've got some things that are looking quite different from the last previous times that I've shared with you guys. So come on, let's go. And I think, I think we've got some flowers that we have to harvest. I wanted to take a couple of minutes before we get going on this garden tour and just tell you all how thankful I am for each and every one of you. You guys truly don't know what you are doing and how you're helping. Um, you know, when I started doing YouTube, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna start sharing. I don't know who's gonna wanna listen. Um, and really, it was my friend Jess from Roots and Refuge. It's her fault. She's the reason why I'm doing a YouTube, doing YouTube and sharing. But honestly, I'm very thankful. I'm thankful that I, I listened. I'm thankful that I stepped out in front of fear and just decided to just put it out there and share. Uh, I know that God has got a plan for all of this, and I know that there is a reason. Um, but you guys are a huge part of it. You guys sharing my videos sharing things that that you've learned um, from our our channel or or just having that open conversation about plants that you guys use bees all of it it's a community and that's what i i truly i'm truly thankful for you guys are the absolute best um and yeah without you guys i don't think this channel would be as big as it is um, and it's growing every single day so with that, I just have to add that I am in grow zone 6B. I'm in Virginia. That gives you kind of an idea of like our growing zone. Um, so when we start talking about the plants, you'll see that, you know, some things I was a little late to the game for, uh, but it's okay because things are growing and that's that's what gardening is always about. It It is textbook, but it doesn't always have to be textbook. And sometimes you just have to plant a seed and see and see what happens. My goodness, look at this comfrey that we have growing. I have some growing here in my raised beds because we're gonna be harvesting the root um, to make some pretty awesome, awesome stuff with it in future. But it is, look how big that thing is. That's huge. My wild lettuce is still wild. I'm gonna come in through here and I wanna harvest a bunch of these uh, so that I can take the leaves and dry them. And then my mom and I still wanna come back through here and, and do the slow cook down method for the, the wild lettuce so that we can, we can actually tincture the black tar uh, that you're gonna get from when you're slow cooking down the wild lettuce. But I have all of this growing and then I have more uh, back actually in the apiary spot, which I need to I need to tend to so that's coming and if you're interested in learning about how we actually set up Wild lettuce and talked about it uh, medicinally speaking. I have a video where we set up the wild lettuce in a in a tincture I'll put that down below. I just shared that the other day. So that's fairly fresh But we still got to come up here and do some work and that's coming but look how gorgeous this is We are going to be harvesting and setting up yarrow, um, drying it and doing a good tincture. We have a weekend uh, women's wild crafting 
workshop, boy, you say that 10 times, coming up. Um, so a lot of these plants I'm kind of holding off from harvesting because we're gonna use this and, and actually enjoy it during our, during our workshop. Um, so I'm gonna be teaching people how to, you know, how do you harvest these plants? And then uh, drying them and then also setting them up in tincture and uh, and then also the other the other things that you you can do with it we we're gonna have a really fun weekend so I'll put on my website after that workshop I don't have anything scheduled yet um, but I am gonna be looking at some dates I do have a workshop coming up for the Homesteaders of America conference, which will be a beekeeping workshop, but it's not just beekeeping. We also do, because I'm an herbalist as well, <laughs> so we also start kind of talking about the product making of the medicinal, the medicinal byproducts of bees, and we kind of go into detail. Plus we get to harvest honey, make some salve. Um, I'll show you how to do propolis tinctures. It's just a really fun workshop. And then of course getting everybody into the colonies to do hive inspections. I will put the Homesteaders of America workshop down below if anyone is interested or if they're coming to the conference, we have our workshop on Thursday. So right before the conference and it's a blast. It is an absolute blast. This valerian plant is so stunning and it's massive and it is going to seed. So that is what I need to that is what I need to do next is as soon as it is good to go, I'm going to harvest. I want to save seeds. I really want to save seeds. I'll tell you what, valerian has become one of my favorite my favorite plants uh, recently. I haven't harvested the root. I want the seeds first. I have a few baby valerian that is a passion flower, but I have a few baby valerian under there that I'm going to let grow. Um, but this one, look how stunning it is. Get a quick breather here. Something's crawling on me. Okay, I'll tell you what. So we set up a valerian root um, tincture, which I know I've talked about valerian root, but if you guys are new, that's okay. I'm going to, oh, we're going, we're going to just talk about it again. We set up a valerian root tincture. I like valerian, but it does smell like a stinky feet. It smells like stinky feet. Um, but the other day I worked this garden a good bit and my body was so sore. I mean, my back was like cramping. I was spasming because, you know, it's a lot of work to maintain a garden. I thought about taking the camera with me on that day, um, but it was too hot and I just needed to get it done um, because it needed a little love. Uh, but as soon as I was done, I came in and I had um, a valerian, my valerian root tincture, and I immediately took some, and it was just enough to just settle my back pain. And I slept amazing <laughs> as well um so i think that is something that we're gonna kind of take you guys and show you next is um how to set it up as a tincture because you don't just have to have it in a tea i mean and that's where a lot of people don't necessarily like the taste of valerian i love valerian so much more in a tincture form than what i do <laughs> in a tea form um but a little trick too is valerian pairs really well with lemon balm and with chamomile and lemon balm and chamomile have such a sweet taste at least the chamomile the chamomile actually chamomile linden flower and leaf those two are super super sweet um but not like not like disgustingly sweet they're just like sweet like honey so if you use those two herbs to cover up the valerian it does kind of help <laughs> uh, and lemon balm too. All three. They're all sedatives. So you're just going to sleep really, really good. And that's exactly what my body needed. But, um, but I took some valerian and it was just enough. It was absolutely perfect. Um, and the other one that I also love that's growing right beside it that I'm touching right here is my passion flower. And let me show you because the archway, the passion flower fortress is starting, is starting. It's gorgeous. 
But here in the next few weeks, all of this passion flower will grow up and over and we will have a beautiful fortress of an archway. The only thing that I have to do is I have to be careful because it also likes to grow in random spaces. Like I found that I have passion flower growing up in my native honeysuckle um, that I need to I need to tame. I have to tame this passion flower. Uh, but this side is going to be this is going to be very stunning. And uh, soon we're going to have some flowers that are going to be opening up, which is also my absolute favorite. Now, passion flower is a very calming and relaxing medicinal plant as well. You can use the leaves, you can use the flowers. In fact, when the plant has a nice young little tendril right there. Um, you can even take it and eat it kind of as it is. It has like an asparagus taste to it. And one of my favorite things to do in the summertime when it's super, super hot is when the flowers are blooming, the bees tend to go and hang out in the flowers and the bumblebees, <laughs> the bumblebees will fall asleep in the flower and it's, it's adorable. Nice hey, sweet girl. They do love, absolutely love the echinacea. I've got some Thai long beans that are getting ready to start to grow up and over, which are going to be very pretty because we're going to have some draped down. Um, and then I'm also using this side for some beautiful little tomatoes. Hopefully they will make it and start growing a little bit bigger now that I cleaned them up and weeded out all the stuff that was kind of choking them out. Um, that definitely tends to happen here in these gardens. So I've kind of showed a little bit about this side. We also have mint, I've got oregano, I've got thyme, I've got some dill. It's very pretty. Um, but let's go over to the in-ground garden area. And the bees don't seem to be bothering me too much. All right, this is the work in progress. Um, I'll start right here. So this is the Avena sativa. These are the oats. So we use the oat straw, we use the oat tops dried, and then we also use the oat tops in, um, made into a tincture, which is called milky stage oats. What we're looking for is the immature grain. I don't think we're there quite yet, to be honest with you. Uh, I think we need to just wait a little bit longer because the the milk that is kind of in it, yeah, no, nope, not there yet. So the milk, the milky substance that is inside of the grain when it's immature is full of magnesium. I mean, it's full of minerals. It's so good for, for your, your nervous system. Um, it, it's a, a neuroprotectant, so when you use it in a tincture form, um, it kind of, to me, I just describe it like it puts, it just kind of coats, coats your nervous system. I use it in a tincture form, um, but it's packed full of magnesium, potassium, zinc, oh, beta-glucans, vitamins, all of the goodness that we are, that we want. But we're going to harvest the oat tops and the oat straw as well. Uh, and then uh, basically macerate up, macerate up the immature um, grain pods so that we can uh, put it in, a, in an alcohol-based tincture. Um, I, I know people, a lot of people are asking about other forms of tinctures too. You can do the same thing. And I, I'm going to start talking about that because I, I understand and I completely respect the people who aren't do aren't okay with using alcohol, but you can also use vinegar as well. I am not a big fan of the vinegar by taste. Um, I don't mind doing it. There are a few things that I do want to be able to preserve. Vinegar would probably work well with this because it actually would keep more of the minerals in the in the oats. It's just it's going to taste like vinegar. The alcohol. I don't mind personally, um, but I, I respect that and I'm, I do need to start sharing that with you guys because I think that that's very important and what I don't want to do is deter people from making their own plant medicine if they see that I'm using alcohol. Um, so I'm going to start talking about that 
when we when we do videos like that uh, just to be like you can use this or this but there is a little bit difference when it comes to the expiration date of that tincture which is why i mainly do use alcohols uh, because the expiration date is substantially longer than than a vinegar base and most of our plants that we already have tinctured they're in a lot of them are in alcohol. I do have some that are in vinegar though. And I, I, I so I will do better <laughs> about talking about that and sharing with you guys, um, sharing with you guys. But I think, I think we just need to wait a little bit longer. But isn't this so exciting? So I am very excited about this beautiful plant that we have growing. I've got a few rows of it. Um, but this one is ashwagandha and I'm a rule breaker <laughs> and I'm going to share with you why. All right. I think it's just going to be easier to sit you guys down. Okay. So <laughs> let me talk to you. I'm just taking this off. <sighs> it's easier sometimes for me to just bear with the sun the gnats aren't too bad so i'm gonna hold out and the bees don't seem to be caring one bit about me but this beautiful little plant that i have growing right beside me is called ashwagandha now yeah i've never grown ashwagandha before so this is gonna be a learning lesson for me i am learning that there's little bugs that do like to eat it so i've been coming in and basically coming over here and just picking them off individually um, if I do use anything which I really don't um, but I do need to kind of clarify because I have bees so I have to be very mindful um, about any products and honestly having bees on my homestead have they've actually made me uh, a better gardener because I'm more aware of what I'm putting into my garden um, that's why I don't use any chemical sprays because I don't want to hurt my babies um, but if I were to do anything, which I might have to, um, just because I, I really want to protect this little plant, but I would take uh, diatomaceous earth and I would just kind of rub it just on the leaves. Um, and I would do that to, to other plants. However, I don't <laughs> because I'm kind of one of those lazy gardeners that I'm just going to grow a bunch of it and hope that I will get some harvest um, versus going every so often and, and doing the powdering, especially this time of year. This time of year, I literally get thunderstorms every day. So it's hard to use diatomaceous earth because obviously the water is going to wash it off. But if I were to do anything, it would be diatomaceous um, and I would basically just do the leaves and not the flower part because I don't want to hurt my don't want to hurt my beautiful golden girls that I have flying. Um, so now with that uh, the other thing that I do is just come up and look look for the bugs and I hunt um, and I, I want to come up here you know I want to spend time in the garden and I want to spend time with these plants but ashwagandha is uh, it's a very lovely adaptogen plant um, the medicinal properties of it that I'm seeking are the adaptogens you know helping with your adrenals adaptogens are a category of plants a category of herbs that just kind of help your body maintain like a beautiful balance and i've shared a lot of these plants are adaptogens like holy basil um oh gosh now i'm gonna get a brain fart <laughs> Anyways, long story short, I'm a rule breaker because this is not supposed to be growing in my grow zone. I can't exactly remember what the grow zone was, but it's definitely more for a warmer climate versus where we're at. Um, but it's not dead. Now, that's to say, not to say that I can't, I won't be able to see it through I'm not quite sure so this is an experiment for me um, but you can harvest the leaves and the root the root is what we would probably use more of um, that is kind of what I already have um, I don't think I have any of the leaves but I was doing some reading about the leaves that, that you can use them medicinally but ashwagandha is referred to as Indian ginseng and uh, I it's also been shared that it gives you kind of like that like the stamina of a horse um 
So we're gonna talk more about this. Uh, and again, it might be a total bust if it doesn't grow here or continue to grow. I do have some that I have in the apothecary that I have ethically sourced um, to, to use as well. Uh, but I had to share this with you because it's just too cool to see it growing. And um, I'm okay being a little bit of a rule breaker. <laughs> And check out all of the calendula. It is all starting to pop open and be so very beautiful. When it comes to the calendula, I actually need to go ahead and start harvesting now. Um, and I might actually do that. I might grab my basket and start popping them open because there's a few that I'm seeing that are, are already a little too far. And then we have so many that are already becoming um, ready to be to new growth. So basically when you harvest your calendula, the, the one thing that I will say is like flowers. I don't like to harvest my calendula if they're wet. So I like a nice dry temperature, dry sun. We've had a lot of rain recently. Um, which is why I haven't harvested it uh, because every day I go to harvest, it's like, ah, but if you need calendula, harvest it, you know, when you can. Um, but I think I'm going to go ahead and do that today. Uh, what you would do is basically you get it either take your, take your thumb or, um, pop them, but you grab them, you harvest a little flower and then I'm going to hang it. Uh, on my, my drying rack. I love calendula and salves. So for me, what I'll do is I'll probably take them and just dry them all and then uh, take them and put them, uh, get them infused in some oil uh, for our salve making. harvest that we're gonna start doing is probably a little bit of motherwort. I've got a little bit growing and then I also have more feverfew growing here. Now I've shared a little bit about feverfew in the past and I did a whole video about how a leaf a day takes my migraines away. Uh, the leaves kind of have like an aspirin like taste, very much like aspirin, um, but basically in short if you didn't catch that video I'll put that down below. Um, but I want you guys to take a couple of minutes and just read the comments under that video because it's amazing to me to hear other people share their experience with feverfew. Now feverfew is a vasodilator um, so it's going to open up your blood vessels which is why my type of migraine is very constricting. So for me I use feverfew as a preventative versus as a I have a migraine. Um, if I have a migraine I would look at other plants um, this is more preventative like I will take fever few and I, I had some people kind of offer why you get migraines which I know why I get my migraines one I'm either dehydrated which I need to be drinking water right now <laughs> um, and we're really good at not taking care of our body sometimes um, but two some of my migraines are mainly stemmed from like barometer dropping like outside so temperature I, I tend to get high migraines from that uh, so and then of course the Sun which is why I mainly wear my bee veil but y'all probably want to see my face so I'm taking it off um, for for this video uh, but yeah I want you guys to like take a couple of minutes and just read other people's comments on the fever feel and do your own research any plant that I'm talking about I want you guys to do your own research uh, because one plant is going to offer multiple things so I might say one thing about each plant obviously this is a long video because we I still have a lot more to show you uh, but yeah I just want you to, to do your own research. It's just gonna make you a little bit better. Um, but yeah, if I had a migraine already, then I would look at, you know, for me, what has helped in the past is um, white willow. Um, taking white willow, also honey. Also sometimes like a, like a fermented, like if I eat something fermented too, like that, I guess that pickle 
that pickle like that also helps with my like if I need salt basically um, that will help but uh, yeah I just wanted to share that with you guys because I think it's really cool and I'm just very excited that other people are sharing sharing their experience with these plants and um, it's just it's good to see other people get build relationships I want to show you because I have holy basil growing I've got whorehound growing I'm going to show you that really quick because then what's beside me oh so exciting we're going to make some whorehound candy um, which I'm pumped about and then this year some of them didn't survive uh, but that's okay this is my other absolute favorite medicinal herb that we have growing in our garden. This is called holy basil. It's Tulsi. Um, this is one of my favorite herbs to add into our teas. It is a beautiful adaptogen. Again, adaptogens are going to help just keep your body at a nice, beautiful balance. And um, yeah, I love it. I absolutely love the smell of it. It is just quite stunning um, but I'm hoping some of these take off I plan on saving seeds and last year I gave a lot of our seeds to um, people from the Homesteaders of America conference and it makes me happy to see that other people are growing our holy basil that we from us um, from our garden so that makes me that makes me happy <laughs> I need to come in here and get this cat mint harvested, which I think we're going to do um, on our women's workshop. They're going to come and help me harvest some of this before it kind of goes all the way to goes to flower. But catnip, cat mint, um, it's got a couple of different words, names, uh, cat leaf, all of that. Um, but cat mint is really good medicinally, uh, very calming. We, we say there's a whole story behind for the cranky baby. If anybody's being cranky, whether it's an adult or not, one of our good relaxing, relaxing herbs. And then over here, I have, look at all this lemon balm. I love the smell of lemon balm. It is so beautiful and so juicy, and I cannot wait to get this harvested as well. We're going to be doing this, but it's funny because it's like sedative sedative oh look at that sedative i feel like my garden is just all sedatives <laughs> all nervines all relaxing um but that's okay i grow what we use but look look at all my chamomile i gotta harvest that and that i think we're gonna do a little bit just a little bit today The beautiful chamomile that I have growing is the German chamomile. Um, this, we started as seed and, you know, it never ceases to amaze me how one tiny seed can turn into thousands of seeds. You know, one seed makes how many flowers, which then make how many seeds. And this is the, the regenerative aspect that we are gonna go for. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to harvesting and saving seeds as well. Now chamomile is one of my favorite medicinal herbs that a lot of people are already familiar with. You know, a lot of the teas, the sleepy time tea, it's chamomile. But there's something about actually blending a tea from fresh chamomile versus the little store-bought packets. Now I'm not saying that those store-bought packets are bad, um, but to me the freshness is what I, I am after. And so one little seed has produced an infinity. <laughs> okay, maybe not an infinity. But I love how one seed can grow hundreds of flowers, which then can produce how many more seeds? You know, so I have a good bit growing right now because I know how much chamomile we actually use. Um, I use chamomile in tea form. Um, I can tincture it. I like it in tea form. Tincture is great too. Um, uh, turning it and making making a, uh, a glycerin with your chamomile. That's something I need to do again with you guys because that was a total fail of a video that I attempted to do. And so we're gonna redo that, but anyways. 
back to this chamomile. This is German chamomile and we will be saving some seeds as well. I came across this handy dandy. My boy child is riding around. Um, I came across this. This is a berry picker. I got it from Amazon. I'm gonna put it on my Amazon storefront. I think I got two of them for 20 bucks, but I figured I would give it a shot. And since I was already planning on harvesting, um, it might make it easier. You know, when you're going in and you're picking chamomile flowers, if you're having to pick one at a time like that, um, who's gonna want to do that? I know that it's, if I only had, oh, it smells so good. If I only had one plant, I think it would be one thing, but I have, I think I have 10, 20, 30, 40, like 50, 50 chamomile plants. Um, so I think this will be better. If I like it, I'll tell you guys and I'll put it on my Amazon storefront. That link is down below. We're gonna talk about that as well because I have some other cool things. But let's see if this thing works. I'm excited. Oh, and the best time to harvest I found is that really, honestly, when the, I'll show you one. We're gonna get a few from different various ages, but the, the flower petals start to drop um, that's about the good time to harvest, but again, I'm, I'm going to probably get a few from various ages. That's, I guess the, oh, wow. I guess that's the downfall of using something like this, um, <laughs> because you're not exactly able to pick and choose the ages. So, okay, this is fun. I could do this. Yeah. So basically you just kind of, uh-oh. <laughs> and then, all right, I got one that has a little stem on it. I accidentally kind of did that, but I think this is still going, oh, I lost that one. I think this is still going to be a lot easier than going individually. So I'm going to, I'm going to get in here and pick some and um, show you my harvest. Okay, I like it. That's pretty easy. I went ahead and grabbed the baskets real quick. Um, the temperature is starting to get super, super hot and I just looked up because I heard some thunder and it looks like we are possibly getting ready to get hit with a storm. So I was like, okay, no, let's get these, let's get these flowers to the apothecary. I'm going to show you how we dry them. So let's go. When it comes to drying your flowers or, or really a lot of your herbs, I have three different ways that I do it. Um, my preferred technique is to freeze dry. I absolutely love using my freeze dryer. It maintains the nutritional and the medicinal value of the plants to the fullest degree. So it treats it pretty much just like a fresh plant uh, versus your dehydrating, which would reduce some of that. And then the other technique is air drying. So to me, my, my tier is freeze dried, air dried, and then dehydrating. There's nothing necessarily wrong with dehydrating. I just wanna get as much medicinal punch from the plant matter as possible. So that's why I like to use, I like to use my freeze dryer. Um, but today we're gonna air dry these. We're gonna hang them up. I've got this hanging basket that I have stored kind of tucked away in the corner of the apothecary in a little closet area. I do have that on my Amazon storefront, so I'll make sure to put that link down there if anybody's curious about where I got this thing from. I love it because it collapses and it folds up super easy, so if I need to get it out of the way, I absolutely can. However, with the abundance of foraging and plant matter, we have had that thing pretty much open and loaded up 
it's open and loaded up 24 seven. I only take it down when I really need to. Um, but the camo meal, oh my goodness. It smells, it smells like honey. Ah, it's like the most beautiful smell absolutely ever. And then the calendula, you know, I'm touching the flowers and you don't realize how kind of sticky the flowers kind of are. Now we did leave a good bit, okay? Like I left a good bit of calendula. There's gonna be a bunch that are gonna be popping open and the same thing for the camo meal. I didn't even make a dent in the camo meal. I tried to only harvest the ones that I knew were pretty much ready, but there are a few in here that are, I would have let grow <laughs> a little bit more. Um, but using using the the basket, using the harvesting little uh, berry collector, it made it a lot faster for me to harvest it that way versus going and picking them individually. If I only had one plant, I don't think I would invest in something like that. I would have just done it by hand, but because I have so many, it just made it easier. Now the calendula, that was easy. I just snipped it. Um, but we are gonna harvest more. And what I'm hoping for next is the next time that we harvest, let's go ahead and plan on preserving them a different way, drying them a different way. So when it comes to drying your calendula, really, it's super simple. You could lay it down on a towel um, or a drying rack, whatever you do. What I like to do is just flip them over and dry them, just have them dry that way. Now these will take a little while, but that's okay because we've got time. I already have some dried, um, but that is all that you're going to do. And yes, snipping the head is not going to hurt them at all. There's going to be so many more that are going to be popping up and popping open and how beautiful. I made sure to definitely and then closer to the end of the season, one of the things that I like to do is I do like to let some just go to seed so that we can have, have more for the next, for the next year. So it's very beautiful <laughs> and you can get them close together too. The biggest thing is just don't stack them. I don't like to stack them on top of each other because you, you do want you want the moisture to be able to come out. For this lovely chamomile, we're pretty much gonna do the same exact thing. We're gonna lay it out on my drying rack, um, single layer. You don't wanna stack it. You want as much air to move through the plant matter to help dry it as possible. So this will be easy. And just kind of throw it in there. <laughs> nothing, nothing too fancy. And then while it's in here, I'll move it around. And um, get it as, as even as possible. And basically I'm just kind of going in, spreading them out a little bit so that they're not all clumpy, dropping some, <laughs> of course. Ugh. I, my floor is clean. These are gonna be for us, not for anybody else. So I'm okay with it. Um, and that's something I have to add to as well. You know, you do want to be very mindful about the plant matter that you're using. So chamomile, there are some people who are actually allergic to chamomile. Um, chamomile is in the Asteraceae family. So is wild lettuce. And I put that video out the other day. Um, and you wouldn't think that they were actually in the same family, <laughs> but they are. Um, so when you're doing anything with plant matter, uh, making plant medicine with it, you do want to know, or at least know how to look up what plant, um, what plant family, each plant that you're working with. This is for us. I'm fine with it. But if I were doing this more professionally, not just for me, for myself and my family, 
Um, I would probably only use uh, chamomile. I wouldn't kind of cross, potentially cross contaminate is, is how you would think about it, how you would do it. But this is for us, this is for me. Um, so I'm fine with it. And if you do go to offer your dried plants, just be mindful of that because of the potential cross contamination. I'm fine with it. We're using it. This is literally going to be for us. So I know nobody in my family, nobody in my family is allergic to the Asteraceae family. So we're good with it. But I just had to put that in there because it gives you a thought process to, to start thinking about your apothecary. One of the most important things though that I will add is that when you are drying your plants, make sure that they are fully dry before you store them in your, in your jars. You would be so devastated if you go to open up your jar of chamomile to make a tea and realize that it's molded because you didn't dry it long enough. Um, so I always say a couple of weeks and just let it do its thing. It's not hurting me over there in that corner. I'll get to it when I get to it. I have some already ready to go in this jar, um, but if I needed it in a hurry, that's where I would throw it in my dehydrator. But we've got time and I have a good bit more that is growing out in the garden. Thank you guys for coming along with me and going on a garden tour as well as harvesting some beautiful flowers with me and getting them set up to dry. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna go enjoy the rest of my day. So as always, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty and learn something old. Bye guys.